Welcome. I am a physician at Upstate Medical University. The Syracuse community has welcomed many refugees over the past few years. During the next few minutes, you will be informed about a tradition called female genital cutting. Other terms include female genital circumcision or female genital mutilation. Our objective is to inform health practitioners about where and why it is practiced, the various procedures performed, and the possible health consequences so that you may better serve your patients. Female genital cutting is a tradition. Traditions are customs, beliefs, and values of a community which govern and influence a member's behavior. Traditions are learned behaviors which are passed on from generation to generation. Traditions identify a community and can have positive, neutral, or negative consequences. The habits of traditions are often difficult to change. Female genital cutting is a tradition of circumcision in females. It involves the partial or total removal of the female external genitalia whether for cultural or any other non-therapeutic reasons. The following video is an interview with a refugee from Somalia. She is a skilled caseworker with many years of experience assisting refugees that are resettling in our community. She is a valued member of our care team. I am with uh, Marion uh, and she is a case manager for our Somali refugees here at Catholic Charities in Syracuse, New York. And I'd like to have her share her knowledge and experience regarding the topic of female genital cutting. As I recall, there are different types of genital cutting uh, and different age groups uh, that have it in the females. Could you share that with us, Mary? Yeah, yes, sure. Uh, the female genital mutilation or circumcision, uh, in Somalia we have three types. Uh, the first type is called pharaonic and was practiced mainly in the rural area or in the nomadic area of part of Somalia. And that uh, is the practice that removing is the worst one is removing all the genital part of the woman, clitoris, the uh, big lab, the small lab, they remove all. It, it's so hard to even recognize the genital part of the woman, uh, that, that, that practice of pharaonic. That uh, leaves only a small a hole where uh, it's really a little bit small that it can flow the urine or the menstrual uh, blood. And, and in order to put together, they do some stitches on, on, on the where they cut the clitoral and all that part. And then the worst part is they already practice, in, not in the hospitals, they always do in the homes and in the open area where the women are, or the girls are at risk of the infections. And they don't have anything uh, sanitary. And in order to stop the bleeding, they use uh, some, uh, 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 herbal from from the from the trees, and that is cause most of the abscess later in 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 the age of the girls when they become uh, more women, and also sometimes is affected also the shape of their vagina, and it seems that the fistula is coming up from there. That is the abscess that is comes from these trees they put, and and that is make more women difficult even in the bleeding time and they have ongoing pain that is so hard to understand where really it comes from this bleeding because even the bleeding is not flowing well and there's residue also because of this uh, uh, material they're using even the clothing that's the worst part and the woman really suffers not only when they are young but even when they become a woman and they have childbearing period has a difficult because is opening that, that area again is very harmful. And then uh, the other practice 
that the women also like or the girls like is to close again uh, uh, that that area and to have still that small worry. That's because it's kind of a stigma. And the, it's a painful, they know it's painful, but they rather having that one because of, of the cultural belief of, of, of this society. And what age group uh, are the uh, women or females, uh, do they receive this uh, it's, procedure? It's a little bit different from where they perform this practice. In the rural area, they prefer a uh, woman, uh, the girls, the age between eight, nine, ten. But in the urban area, they always do earlier as five years to uh, eight, between eight years. Mm -hmm. That's the age range that they do. It depends the area they come, they do these circumcisions. And it's our understanding that it is a cultural tradition rather than religious. And yet, at times, uh, the people believe it is religious. Is that correct? Yeah, it's a mixed belief uh, between culture and religion. Uh, we know that it's not really uh, nothing to do with religion, nothing to do with Islam. We know the Somali uh, Somali people are 100% Muslim, and they believe the Islam. But the the circumcision or this cutting practice nothing to do with the Islam. But uh, as a history. Uh, our society is a society of cultural with the, the, the Islam, with the, the religion, and always is, uh, uh, is something is something already uh, access is the easiest way to to promote this one. Is the society when they believe is this religious, they perform as a ritual. They have to do is something that is ritual. That's the reason uh, is, 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 is it, that mixing of cultural and religion, but mm -hmm. it's nothing to do with religion. And it seems that it has been passed down from generation to generation, uh, so there's some pressure from the families and even amongst uh, the, the children. Can you speak about the peer pressure? Uh, yeah, uh, is, this is, is also a mixing understanding because our society is, is a society where uh, 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 we live together with, uh, with the big families, grandmother, mother, and father. And always, as a, as a mother, you always look the grandmother, the grandmother look the great-grandmother. Also, it's kind of, of uh, they have a pressure. And uh, if I have a daughter and my mom doesn't allow that my daughter doesn't have circumcision, because it's the belief. And myself, I have to respect my mother. It's a kind of connections between our society. One thing. The other thing is uh, the stigma. Uh, even the girls itself wants to have a circumcision because believes if, if she doesn't do is, is kind of peer pressure from the other, from the other uh, uh, friends in school or in the society. And uh, it's very important to also understand uh, is something also connected with her marriage because she believes if she doesn't do this circumcision, this cutting, nobody is going to marry. And also it's kind of uh, uh, family honor also because if they don't have a, 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 the daughter circumcised, even the family feels bad when the man comes and asks the girls to marry if it's something that going down the, the, the family honor. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's another, another stigma. Uh, beside the, the whole family that they believe. Okay. And uh, the infections, sometimes they occur and they attribute to other things, like malaria, you had said. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, during uh, this practice uh, always is associated because uh, uh, they, they, they tie the legs of the girls from the toe to the hips and she cannot move for around three, four weeks because they want to heal all those uh, uh, surgery they did it to the woman without any medicine. And sometimes it causes that they have a fever. But the only fever known, especially in the rural area, is the malaria. And the people, they mix it with infection with the malaria and they think, oh, she's sick for the malaria. And that's where it comes from most of the mortality of the, those girls. They don't believe that this circumcision is connected to the death of that girl because those infection is very, is very painful. And that is something that is 
we have a high rate of mortality during this circumcision also, especially in the rural and nomadic area. Well, thank you very much. Female genital cutting is practiced in only certain regions of the world. The past few years, many refugees have immigrated from regions of high prevalence. For example, the prevalence rates of female genital cutting are greater than 75% among women residing in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Sudan. As Marion stated, there are different degrees of female genital cutting. The World Health Organization has classified female genital cutting into four types. The following slides illustrate or describe the four types. This slide displays the normal anatomy of the female external genitalia. Please use this slide as a reference for the subsequent slides. Type 1 involves the excision of the prepuce with or without excision of part or all of the clitoris. Type 2 involves the excision of the clitoris with partial or total excision of the labia minora. Type 3 is the extensive excision of part or all of the external genitalia and stitching of the vaginal opening. Type 3 is also called infibulation. Type 4 is a range of female genital cutting that does not fall into the first three types. It may simply involve pricking or piercing of the clitoris and or labia during a ceremony. However, type 4 could also include stretching of the clitoris and or labia, cauterization of the clitoris and surrounding tissues, scraping or cutting of the vagina, or corrosive substances and herbs placed in the vagina to cause bleeding or narrowing. The short-term physical complications of female genital cutting include pain, injury of adjacent tissues, hemorrhage, infection, and the risk of shock, acute urinary retention, or even fracture or dislocation. There are many long-term physical complications that may occur from female genital cutting. It includes, but is not limited to, urinary retention, recurrent urinary tract infections, pelvic inflammatory disease, which places the woman at risk for infertility, genital keloids and neuromas, chronic abscesses that may result in vesicle vaginal fistulas or rectal vaginal fistulas long term. The female may have significant pain with intercourse, menstrual flow difficulties, and even complications of labor. All of these complications risk long term emotional suffering. The procedure is often performed by traditional excisors who are commonly the elderly women in the community or traditional birth attendants. More recently, female genital cutting is increasingly being performed in hospitals and health clinics by health professionals. Here in the United States, female genital cutting of minors is illegal. The law states that it is illegal to knowingly circumcise, excise, or infibulate any part of the labia majora, labia minora, or clitoris of a female less than 18 years of age. However, such a surgical operation is not a violation if it is necessary to the health of the person or performed for medical purposes during labor. As clinicians, how should we screen for female genital cutting? First, we should be informed about the tradition and the geographic regions it is practiced. 
if a refugee is from such a region, clinicians should acknowledge to the patient an awareness of the cultural practice of female genital cutting. Inform them that all females are asked about it, educate them that complications occur, and inquire about any past history of the procedure. If she states a history of the female genital cutting ritual, we should inquire about possible complications such as infectious symptoms or pain, difficulty with menstruation, sexual or pregnancy concerns, and any signs of emotional distress or issues. We then should offer an inspection of the female genital region and identify the type of female genital cutting. We should check for scars, infection, abscess, or fistulas and consider the need for a referral to a gynecologist. Thank you for your attention and we hope that this will be a valuable resource for you in your care of refugees.